Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. It just is kind of upsetting when you realize how healthcare can be offered so efficiently and now funds are going to be decreased and barriers are going to be put in place to access these different services and it's upsetting to go backwards and that a declaration means we have to go backwards in care. Welcome to The Health Advocate, a podcast that breaks down major health news of the week to help you make sense of it all. I'm Stephen Newmark, Director of Policy at the Global Healthy Living Foundation. And I'm Zoe Rothblatt, Associate Director of Community Outreach at GHLF. Our goal is to help you understand what's happening in the healthcare world to help you make informed decisions to live your best life. Okay, speaking about what's happening in the healthcare world, a lot has happened since our last episode, Stephen. That's right. The FDA met to discuss annual COVID shots. We got a COVID-19 action plan from the CDC, and we also learned that the COVID public health emergency in the United States will be ending in May. So let's break it down for our community, what they need to know. And I think we'll start with the end of the public health emergency, perhaps the biggest news of all. Yes, for sure. Let's start there. Earlier this week, President Biden informed Congress that he will end the COVID-19 national emergency on May 11th. So these are two emergencies that have been extended throughout the pandemic. The first one started at the end of January when Secretary Alex Azar of Health and Human Services declared a public health emergency. And then in March 2020, as you all recall, um, President Trump declared COVID pandemic a national emergency. And these have just been extended throughout. And now it became the final decision to end and stop extending them. So what is it about this particular week in early February that is leading the White House to make this a declaration? Republicans in the House have been putting pressure on um, to end the pandemic. They have the Pandemic is Over Act, which would end the pandemic immediately. And ending something immediately would have serious consequences on our health system and different programs we've got throughout the pandemic. So with President Biden stepping in and saying, you know, we're, it's going to end on May 11th, it gives the system a few months in order to transition slowly. And what does this mean generally for the public at large? What does it mean to say that the emergency is over as of May 11th is the actual date? First and foremost, it means that the White House believes our pandemic is in a new phase, one that's um, you know less of an emergency than it's been before. What's interesting to note is that the World Health Organization still has COVID as a global health emergency. I know they did say we're reaching this sort of inflection point where um, higher levels of immunity can lower virus-related deaths, but you know we're still in an emergency according to the WHO. So you know what else does it mean? Well, specifically here in the United States, it means we have been getting COVID tests and vaccines for free, as well as COVID treatments. Now, once the emergency declaration is over, it's going to depend on your insurance and potentially your state too. There may be out-of-pocket costs for dealing with these issues. Right. And I was actually thinking, as you said, that it may also be harder to find some of these things. Like for instance, testing. Testing sites have popped up everywhere, especially in New York City. I don't know how it is now, but I remember, you know, basically every two blocks you could find a testing site. And I imagine a bunch of those will shut down now. Right. That is likely to happen, which to be blunt about it, is probably going to have, particularly in the short term, an adverse effect, if you will. The ability to get tested, the ability to obtain vaccines very easily means that they're more widespread. It's certainly not going to increase usage of vaccines and increase usage of testing to uh, ensure that folks who are shedding the virus are out there in the public. One more point on not necessarily losing these services, but maybe now there's going to be a little bit more barriers. It just is kind of upsetting when you realize how healthcare can be offered so efficiently. And now, you know, funds are going to be decreased and barriers are going to be put in place to access these different services. And it's upsetting to go backwards. And that a declaration means we have to go backwards in care. We should be clear that for our community, for the Global Healthy Living Foundation community, you know, we'll be watching closely the next three months to see what the transition is like. We'll certainly be advocating that many of the policies 
will continue policies such as the use of telehealth and reimbursement rates for telehealth being commensurate with going in person such that it's easy for folks to access their medical providers. Things such as free vaccines or as much as possible making vaccines as readily available. General promotion of public health, we're going to keep fighting for. We're going to continue providing specific COVID support so long as our community needs it. Amen and underscore that the end of the public health emergency does not mean the end of our resources. In fact, I know we talk about these from time to time. We recently did a quick poll to our COVID-19 patient support program to learn more about you know, what do they want to hear from us? What level of community support for COVID do you want? And about 77% want COVID updates from us weekly or twice a month. And then 73% want updates on COVID treatments and vaccines. 70% said they want updates on variants. And then 68% said they want information on how their medical conditions and medications may affect recovery from COVID. So It's just interesting to learn this from our community so that we're able to provide the best resources and and learn what our community wants, even as the general public may want something else. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll continue to be a resource and we'll continue fighting for resources and needs of our community, but really public health in the United States. You know, speaking of losing resources or restricted access, we recently got news that the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, revised its decision and said that it no longer recommends Evisheld. Just as a reminder, Evisheld is the preventive treatment for immunocompromised individuals for COVID. And the reasoning behind this was they said that more than 90% of the COVID cases are from the new variants and those sublineages, and data shows that Evisheld isn't protective against these. So as long as we see these high numbers of the new sublineages, it's not going to be recommended to get. And that's one of the things I think that we're going to keep fighting for is the idea of looking for new treatments. And I think that's what we need as we enter this next phase of COVID-19. You know, we got a lot of messages from our community saying like, Evisheld has helped me live a normal life and help me feel protected because I didn't get enough protection from the vaccine. So, you know, we definitely want an Evisheld. Shell 2.0, whatever that looks like. Definitely. We need treatments and we need a real push to get proper treatments. So we'll keep pushing forward on that. If Evisheld is not protective, you know, we don't want to just give out a placebo for, for no reason, of course. So exactly. It's a risk benefit analysis. And right now the benefits don't outweigh the risks. But what we did get was an action plan from the CDC for people with weakened immune systems. I'm curious for your thoughts, but to me, it felt like more of the same that we've been hearing. I agree. I mean, the outline essentially says, get the updated COVID vaccine. It's like, duh, who doesn't know that? Particularly for those with weakened immune system. Improve ventilation and spend time outdoors. Okay, we've been hearing that for almost three years now. It's cold. That's not that easy. Especially, right. you know, my aching joints. Um, right. I don't want to sit outside in 30 degrees. Thank you. I know. Let me go. Th- let me go through the rest of these, okay. and you'll, you know, try to refrain from laughing. Learn about testing locations and treatment options before getting exposed or sick. Get tested if you've been exposed or have symptoms. Wash your hands often. Wear a well-fitting respirator or mask and maintain distance in crowded spaces. This is what we've been hearing since basically 2020. It puts the burden on people with weakened immune systems. The CDC messaging did say, like, for those in your household, too, these things are really important. But it's just a messaging that says, you know, if you're the group affected, you have to take action. And it's not about everybody else, which is really upsetting because... There's just so much burden on people with disabilities already. And now to say like, this is what you have to do in order to stay safe. It's more of the same. It's not giving us new answers. So it's hard for me to formulate thoughts because I just feel like the aching hearts of our community and reading all this news this week. Just to give a a slight positive spin, I guess it formalizes things that we've known, which is good. I don't know. I guess also, I just thought about, you know, other public health emergencies have ended and I I didn't look back a few months down the line and said, you know, I really wish that emergency was still here. I didn't feel the effects. Absolutely. You know, we recently talking about the MPOX declaration ended, looking back at Zika, those kind of things ended and life went on. And that gives me a bit of comfort. No, absolutely. I said, you know, earlier in the uh, podcast, I spoke about the short-term effects. The long-term effects are likely to be positive. You can't constantly be in a state of emergency all the time. And it gives some more gravitas in the future 
should the CDC, should the U.S. generally need to make another declaration for an emergency for COVID or for another virus? So, you know, unfortunately, public health, as we know, the image has been eroded in recent years. Living in a constant state of emergency, I think, has not helped that. Whereas if we take out the emergency and then we need to re-put it back in at some point, I think we'll be in a better state long term. That's a good way to frame it. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. Unfortunately, that doesn't fit onto uh, a good talking point, <laughs> a nice yeah. succinct talking <laughs> point. I guess that's the advantage of being on a podcast. We could talk for about 30 seconds at a time. Let's move on now and discuss an important meeting that the FDA recently held where they voted to approve an annual vaccine for COVID, similar to what is done for influenza. At first, I was wondering why now is this meeting, but given all the news, I'm actually so happy that there's a plan in place for vaccine rollout and that it seems like we're we're looking at the strategy going forward, even if an emergency is declaration. So what is this? What did they vote on? Basically, they voted to approve an annual shot like the flu, which would basically say, you know, at this time you're eligible and it might mean, you know, two vaccines for immunocompromised or people that are older. And they also voted in order to say we should use the bivalent formula going forward and that, you know, you shouldn't have to start with your primary series and then be eligible. If you just show up, you should be able to get the new formula. Hopefully, this will be more akin to the flu vaccine. Of, of course, flu vaccines are not taken by enough of the population, as we know, but it at least puts us on a firmer footing. It sets us almost on a path of some regularity when it comes to COVID. Do you think that we're at a time where we can look at COVID in that regularity with the waves? On a positive note, we have had Omicron for over a year now. So there will always be waves. And just like with flu, there'll always be new variants. Just like with flu, there will be seasons that will be particularly harsh and others that we hope will be mild. It's obviously impossible to predict with precision, but the hope is that there's some level of predictability. I'm just thinking about how I don't even think about the flu until the fall comes around. Like it really goes out of my mind in the summer. Right. It's much more seasonal. And I don't feel like I've had that freedom with COVID yet. Well, COVID's new. As more people build up some levels of immunity and continue to build some levels of immunity, you know, the hope is it will weaken. There's a hope that treatments will continue to develop to make it more livable. Like I said, it's still a new virus and we're still adjusting to it. But, you know, flu was pretty scary when it first came on the scene in, in 19, what was it, 1918, 1919? Mm -hmm. The original pandemic. <laughs> yeah. The old, well, the old school, old school virus. Yeah. You know, but the hope is it will not be quite so damaging. I think the scary thing is that is for me, I think back to the early days of, of 2020, March, April, May, when there was this hope that we would just eradicate COVID, we would stay inside and it would go away. And now right. it looks like it will be here forever, like the common cold, like the flu. You know, I would want to say, man, oh man, it didn't have to be this way, but here we are. I know. Now, you know, we're almost at March 2023, three years later. It's hard to believe even all that time has passed. So I have a question. How would this actually work in getting an annual COVID vaccine? Like what happens in predicting the flu shot? So for the flu, scientists at the World Health Organization meet twice a year. For the Northern Hemisphere, the strain decision that they decide to develop a vaccine for is discussed and decided upon in February for a fall vaccine rollout. So essentially, they look at what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere, what's likely to transpire in the Northern Hemisphere the following fall. So that would mean that right now, basically, they're starting to meet for next year. Sort of. For COVID-19, the FDA proposed that scientists meet in June for a strain selection for an annual fall vaccine rollout. The timeline is possible for mRNA vaccines, not for Novavax, that short timeline. So we're not sure what, you know, what, that, what that means exactly. So what other questions, I guess, came up that we're not sure about? Well, there's a lot of questions. Let's start with the first. Is this just going to be an annual thing, a once a year thing? The FDA said winter is when the stress is on the hospital systems the most because of other respiratory viruses. We want to concentrate on getting people as 
prepped as possible for the winter rush. The FDA also said it's seeing seasonal patterns. I'm not sure how true that is, but but that's what they're saying. There's a worry that that gives the impression that people only need to worry about COVID during the winter when we know the need is to be concerned at all times. Yeah, especially for people with weakened immune systems. It's constantly on our minds. Absolutely. And even if it's not, you constantly need to be in touch with your doctor and have a plan just in case. It's not like only in the winter could this happen. Absolutely. You know, and just to be clear, look, the, the FDA is looking to do this annually for now, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's set in stone. They're going to always evaluate and reevaluate. Uh, we really just have no idea what the long-term plan is going to look like. Ultimately, I want to move forward and the FDA is looking at data. They're, of course, much smarter than I am. I guess with each phase in the pandemic, I always feel like a bit of apprehension going into it and for then sure. I, I nestle into it. So I I hope this could be like that. What's happening with the rest of the world, though? Well, the uh, WHO provides universal annual recommendations for the flu vaccine. However, many are concerned that the U.S. is going to dictate what is best because this is where the majority of the pharmaceutical industry is located. We have the most buying power. So as the United States goes, the rest of the world may follow. So if we go to an annual plan, that may end up becoming harmonized worldwide. You know, it sounds like there's a lot of discussions being had, unanswered questions. The committee that met the FDA doesn't have to take their recommendation, although they usually do. I'm pretty sure they stamped their unanimous vote on using the bivalent formula, but it's still up in the air about whether we'll get annual vaccines. Bottom line, it sounds like in the future, we will get an updated COVID-19 vaccines, maybe on an annual basis, maybe a booster for some folks like older adults, but not others. But if we use the flu model for COVID, we're looking at uh, an annual seasonal vaccine. Okay, Stephen, I think that brings us to the close of our show. What'd you learn about today? I learned a lot. There's too much in my brain right now. Ultimately, just having this discussion, I, 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 I see the positives and negatives and also just the tension sometimes between individuals' health needs and the population's health needs. And sometimes what's best for the population at large is not necessarily best for you as an individual. So you as an individual may need to take greater precautions when it comes to dealing with COVID still. And it would probably be best for you as an individual if the entire world did the same. But in terms of world population health, if you squeeze too tightly and, and, and demand too much of people, it could have a, a negative effect ultimately as people push back. So you have folks who work in public health, population health, who have a really difficult job in assessing how best to address public health needs. Well said. Along similar lines, I learned that, you know, COVID and handling these public health emergencies or situations is an ongoing learning, and it's important to use our tactics and strategies from the past in order to formulate a plan for the future. But again, it's unknown, and this is why we have experts to continue learning, and, and we'll keep talking about it so long as it matters. We hope that you learn something too. And before we go, I hope that you'll listen to Zoe on Healthcare matters where she discussed her work with biosimilars yeah thanks Stephen. it was really fun to join our colleagues over there and biosimilars are becoming more popular now in 2023 so definitely have a listen and thank you our listeners to listening to the health advocates a podcast that breaks down major health news of the week to help you make sense of it all if you like this episode give us a rating and write a review on apple Podcasts. Hit that subscribe button and check us out on YouTube. I'm Zoe Rothblatt. I'm Stephen Newmark. We'll see you next time. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network.